so this is my first RDS book club. So I'm just gonna kind of plow through, but please do stop me because we want this to be a discussion. Um, so as you have like questions or ideas, um, you know, jump off mute and, um, and let me know. Let me pull up the chat because I don't have that up right now. And that's a little hard to see when you're screen sharing. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, oh yeah, go ahead. So I will check on the chat. So I will let you know if anyone asks questions so you can just share your screen. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. <laughs> that makes it much easier. So hard to try to... Yeah. Uh, yeah, also, I have one question before we go in. When I look yeah. at the later chart chapters, I realize the notes were not existent. You know, having the notes already here were helpful, but okay. then some yeah. of the chapter that I volunteer, I'm like, oh, I'm not sure. I don't know how to logistically put okay, up notes. Okay, so <laughs> the notes are supposed to be written by the presenters in cohort one. So right now we are still in chapter, we are only moving to chapter eight this week. So we are a bit slow due to like the Christmas and the New Year. So I think by the time you reach like the chapters where you're, the week that you're supposed to present, the mm -hmm. notes should be up. I think yes. it will take okay. about like a bit one month later, but like, mm -hmm. we are still like cleaning up the notes and I like, try to upload that as soon as possible. <laughs> no problem, no rush, you know. It's just good to know that it'll be there later. Thank you. Okay. Beautiful. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so Chapter two, um, a, a lot of focus in this one on just sort of like laying the groundwork for the rest of the book. Um, lots of defining vocabulary um, and sort of like setting up the questions that then are explored in all the subsequent chapters. Uh, uh, our training. But when I see the mail where they said they put seven February, me and the thing say the thing don't pass. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Oh God, I want to do one hard volume. I think it was unmute. Is ah. it? That wasn't a question, I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't quite hear, so I wasn't sure. Um, okay, so um, yes, we're going to go over a lot of vocabulary uh, for prediction. We're also gonna talk about error and accuracy, how to evaluate models, um, and the difference between some different kinds of models, especially parametric versus non-parametric, um, and talking about the trade-off between more accurate models and more interpretive models, um, and compare and contrast supervised versus unsupervised learning, um, and comparing and contrast regression versus classification problems, which is just, if you remember about the output, um, the response variable. Um, how to measure the accuracy or goodness of regression model fits, and how to measure the accuracy or goodness of classification model fits, describing how bias and variance contribute to the model error um, and how overfitting fits into that, recognizing the k-nearest neighbor uh, models, and understanding the role of tuning in machine learning models. So tons of content, but they just go through it at a very sort of shallow, um, shallow depth for this first chapter. So we'll try to get through as much of this as we can, but there's no rush because we have next week too. So um, like I said, please do stop if you have questions or if you want to talk about any of these. Um, so they open with this sort of general question, what is statistical learning using this um, sales and advertising data set? Um, and so this is the, the figure that they start with. And what we're looking at here is <clears throat> um, sales in thousands of units for whatever they're selling, um, plotted against the uh, budget for these different types of advertising, newspaper, radio, or TV. Um, and this is just a scatter plot here, but you can already start to see that there, there does appear to be some trends, um, especially maybe in the TV and radio um, types of advertising. So there, there appears to be some patterns going on here. Um, and they've thrown just like a basic linear fit on each one to sort of highlight the, the potential patterns in there. Um, but a question for this might be how to characterize the sales potential as a function of these three media inputs and how do they operate together? So with that kind of in mind, talking about notation, um, a bunch of vocabulary here. Um, we're talking about advertising budgets would be the input variables uh, and then sales would be the output variable. 
input variables are typically denoted with that symbol x um, and then a subscript to distinguish them. So x1 might be TV, x2 might be radio, x3 might be the newspaper budget, etc. cetera. Um, depending on field, you'll see different names for these predictors, independent variables, features, or sometimes just variables. Um, <clears throat> the output variable in this case is sales. Um, and that's also called the response or the dependent variable, um, contrasting with independent variables. And that typically has the symbol Y. Um, and sort of the overall goal of everything we're doing in the entire book is uh, thinking about the relationship between Y and uh, you know, one or more predictors and this, what this function F that describes the relationship between the predictors um, and the response variable. Um, and we are assuming that there's also an error term here. And um, that's really important. Uh, we, we get into more discussion about that. Um, but we're assuming that there is some random independent error uh, that also contributes to the response variable in addition to whatever the, the function of X is. Um, so yes, F is the systematic information uh, or F is the systematic information that uh, X provides about Y. So F is kind of the piece we can learn, basically. Um, and like, that's real basic, but I know that there, there are some differences in terms of, uh, you know, what stats background folks have. So I do want to pause here for a second um, and just see, is there anybody where like this stuff was um, brand new or is this kind of connecting to previous things that you've studied? Um, just this idea of the, sort of, uh, you know, a function of predictors uh, plus a random independent error equals the response variable. Does that feel like familiar to most folks? Good. Yes. All right. Um, okay, so what is f of x good for? Um, with a good f, we can make predictions of y at new points. Um, and we can understand which components are important in explaining why and which components are irrelevant. So depending on the complexity of F, we may be able to understand how each component of XJ affects of X affects Y. Um, and so this idea of predictions versus explaining gets at that uh, when they talk about the different goals of uh, statistical learning, prediction versus inference. And so here we're looking at um, a simulated data Sorry, give me just one second. I have to let my cat out. <laughs> All right. Um, so here we're looking at a simulated data set, years of education versus income. Um, and the data themselves are plotted in red. Um, and in this case, it is a simulated data set. So the, we know we, we know exactly what the true data generating function here is, and it's this represented by this blue line. So that is f of x. And then you can see that um, even in the simulated data set, like if the points aren't exactly on the line, there is a difference between the prediction and the observed point for each one uh, represented by these vertical black lines. So those are the errors. And you can kind of eyeball it here um, and see that some of them are above the line, some of them are below the line. So on average, the mean of those errors should be about zero. Okay, so um, why estimate F? Yeah, and there are sort of two main reasons. One is prediction and then the other is inference. Um, for prediction, the, the goal is to, um, to be able to predict why as well as possible. And it doesn't really matter what actually, what's going on uh, in the rest of the equation. So uh, F hat is often treated as a black box because um, it doesn't really matter what the predictors of the relationships are as long as you're getting uh, a high quality prediction. Uh, the accuracy of Y hat as a prediction for Y depends on two quantities, the reducible error and the irreducible error. Um, and this is something that they really emphasize in the chapter. So, Reducible error is the part that we could potentially improve with a better model, a better choice, or better predictors. Um, so that's the gap between our estimate um, and the true function um, 
that we could potentially shrink that if we're getting better and better methods. Irreducible error is the part that we can't touch. So um, that is either um, that's based on unmeasured variables, things we either didn't or can't measure that influence the outcome, um, or just unmeasurable variation, like truly random noise that's in the response variable. And I'm not sure why we have this hilarious GIF, but it is clearly an, an error that they're making. So maybe that's the joke. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, as they say, the focus of the book is on techniques for estimating F with the aim of minimizing that reducible error and recognizing that there will still be irreducible error that you can't touch. Um, so inference is a, a, the other goal uh, that we might have in mind. And in this case, our interest is um, not necessarily getting, you know, the most accurate prediction for why, but understanding the relationships between why and the predictors so that we're like learning something about the world, basically. Um, uh, so yes, we do not want to treat F as a black box because the, you know, what makes up F is actually sort of the primary interest here. Um, so we might be inter interested in answering questions like which predictors are associated with the response um, what is the relationship between the response and each predictor? So is it, uh, for example, like a positive or a negative relationship with each of those? Um, and can the relationship between Y and each predictor be adequately summarized using a linear equation? Um, or is the relationship more complicated? So in the advertising data we were looking at, we might wanna answer questions like, which media are associated with sales? Um, which media generate the biggest boost in sales? Um, or how large of an increase in sales is associated with a given increase in TV advertising. Um, so thinking then about sort of how we actually estimate F, um, we want to find a function F such that Y is approximately F of X for any observation. Um, broadly speaking, most statistical learning methods for this task can be characterized as either parametric or non-parametric. Um, and very broadly, the, the difference here is that a parametric model is uh, making more assumptions um, and is uh, sort of, it like brings more to the situation, whereas a non-parametric model is uh, more flexible. So a parametric model is a two-step process, really. The first is that you make an assumption about the functional form of F so for example, you might assume that it's a linear uh, equation. And then after you make that assumption, then you apply a procedure to fit or train the model. Um, and a potential disadvantage of the parametric approach is that the model we choose will usually not actually be the, the real true form of F. Um, and if the chosen model is pretty far from the true F, then our estimate is going to be bad. So we're introducing bias there. Um, we can try to address this problem by choosing more flexible models that can fit many different possible functional forms of F. But uh, as is a recurring theme in this chapter, when we get more flexibility, then we start running into potential problems with overfitting as well. Um, and in that case, you're following the data too closely um, so that your model ends up being uh, too close to the, the training data and it won't actually generalize well. Um, to, to test data or to new data. Is the code chunk here, um, I didn't see it in this section of the book, is it the later part of the exercise that are kind of scattered everywhere? Yeah, so I think, so uh, I didn't write these notes, right? These are from the yeah. first cohort, but mm -hmm. um, th this code I don't think is in the textbook. I think mm -hmm. that the first cohort wrote these, um, especially because I, I'm noticing these are like ggplot, uh, they're using the ggplot package uh, and this is you know a lot of tidyverse um okay. tidyverse writing and so on which i don't think is really i mean i i haven't been through the whole book obviously but i don't think they really get into any tidyverse stuff in the book right it feels like they're trying to stick to base r no uh, so so they try to reproduce the graph but they couldn't find the quotes because everything was like in the pdf so yeah. I think this was written by someone else on the GitHub. Then we just copy and paste the codes okay. and yeah, to get. 
Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think that any of this code is actually in the textbook, but for um, for folks that are you know new to R, which I know several of us are, um, this can be kind of interesting to see you know ways to generate different kinds of plots. Um, so if you are interested in like all those GG plots, I think there's a book club running on GG plot too. So maybe you can like join the book club. I think there's a new cohort coming up as well. Nice. Is that the um gosh, what's the I think I know I think I know the book you're talking about, the sort of standard GG plot two text. I've been meaning yeah, to yeah. the data visualization one. Yeah, yeah, I will post the link on the chat. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> I don't know if I can do two book clubs at the same time, but that's very tempting. <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, this this plot here. Um, so we're looking at a linear fit. I actually don't remember this one from the chapter. Is this one in the in the chapter as well? This is maybe just another different plot. Okay. <laughs> um, I think this is a different plot, right? Is I think this, this one is. Chapter? Yeah, I didn't see it in the text part, unless it's in the exercise or something. No, I think this is the additional plot. I think okay. yeah, it is presented. Yeah. I'm going through the coding part of the chapter. It doesn't have any plot, essentially. It has oh. functions to plot something, but it, it doesn't have any plot itself. Yes. Um, but yeah, I think the, the goal behind this visualization is just to, to sort of look, um, you know, here we're looking at a basic linear fit through the data, and we're sort of highlighting one particular point here, and you can see the prediction for um, x of 1 is that the response variable will be about 0.5. Um, and it doesn't look like there's actually any data point right, right there, but you can see that this, that um, prediction falls basically like halfway through this slice of the data. So some of the data are above, some of the data are below. And so we're, we're trying to like slice through the middle basically to get the errors that will um, equal about zero, the average of the errors. Um, and yeah, although, so, um, although linear models are basically never right, <laughs> um, they are actually often a useful and interpretable approximation of real phenomena. Um, and a linear model is like probably the most kind of parent, the most common parametric model. So non-parametric methods then, um, the goal there is you don't make an assumption beforehand about uh, what F is like. Instead, you're just kind of letting your prediction wiggle through the data. Um, with the restraint that you're trying to keep it as smooth or as not rough as possible. So you're trying to get a parsimonious wiggle um, through the data, if you will. Um, yeah, without being too rough or wiggly. So um, any parametric approach brings it with the possibility that the functional form used to estimate F in the training data is very different from the true F, in which case the resulting model will not fit unseen new data well. Um, and non-parametric approaches do also suffer from a major disadvantage, um, which is that you need a very large number of observations in order to obtain an accurate estimate for F. Um, so non-parametric methods are really attractive, but not, not applicable in situations where you don't have enough data to support it. Um, so thinking then a little bit about prediction accuracy. Oh, I have oh, yeah. a question. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not sure because at first I was like using more of a parametric measures. Then I think I read some blog spots where they talk about in my field where they talk about if you use a non-parametric one, is the results that you get might be equivalent to the parametric measures, even though the variances are not equal. So I'm not sure about other few, but in my view, it seems that they are trying to push for more of like non-parametric measures. Yeah, I'm, and can you remind I'm me what, sure. what field you're in? I'm in psychology. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Psych is my background as well. Um, ah. And one thing that's been a, a little weird for me about this chapter is that 
I think in most of the social science literature, non-parametric methods are, um, are used in a, a much more narrow sense where it is these functions that are based, instead of being around the mean, it's based around median or interquartile range or percentiles, that kind of thing. Um, and so it, it is technically non-parametric, but it, it is, I think, pretty different from what they're talking about here. So- um, Yeah, I'm so not sure because it seems that they are like against the non-parametric methods, but for me, like for my view, it's like, it seems that it's okay to use non-parametric methods, especially when you have a small sample size and when, especially when you have like unequal variances between groups or like. Yeah, unbalanced. that's a really good, that's a really good point. Cause for in the social sciences, some, so you're thinking about like, um, mm. I can't remember any of the names cause they all have weird names, but like there's the like Kursky-Wallace test instead of an ANOVA, that kind of thing, right? Yeah, like the Welch test, like let's Welch say test. instead of like the yeah, the student T test, we are using like the Welch or the for the ANOVA, we're also using the Welch one. Yeah, the Welch I'm not sure. Yeah, so yeah. so that's the more recent one that I was like reading on where they like totally I think, like trying to promote non-parametric measures. <laughs> yeah, I, I this is a little rusty for me, but I think the Welch approximation is um is actually still a parametric measure right it's just that the assumption of equal variance is relaxed if i'm, I'm not sure i thought it was like considered as a non-parametric one maybe oh, but check. either way I, th I think you're very right that and i and i um i think it's an issue with this term um non-parametric because mm. here in the in the context of the book uh what they mean is like non-model really right like yeah. without an assumed model form. And then within the model, you have parameters that you estimate. And so that's why you would call it a parametric model or yeah, a parametric model, mm. a parametric method, because you're estimating the parameters of a model. And then in a non-parametric method, there is no model. So there's no real parameters to estimate. Um, and I think that's kind of a different animal from the, like the class of non-parametric null hypothesis tests yeah. um, that we typically, that's yeah, because those work great yeah. for small sample sizes. Um, mm. And they are like uh, analytically tractable. Like you, if you shouldn't, but you can do them with a pen and paper. <laughs> um, yeah, that's why I was like confused at these subsections because it seems that we are using like the same terms, but yeah. then in a different way. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it is that. And I, I do think that's that those are not really uh, equivalent. Like I don't think that... Uh, the authors of this book are thinking about that kind of non-parametric test where they're talking about these non-parametric methods here. I get the same sense from the text itself also. It's on page 22, right? Where it mm. explains non-parametric model. Essentially, what the sense that I'm getting is instead of, instead of using more details, it's using closer to a linear uh, approximation rather than the conventional concept of parametric versus non-parametric um, parameters. Oh. I'm using the, it's after figure two, five, where you okay. had that equation. If you scroll down to the next page, yeah, there it is. Non-parametric methods. That's, that's a concept that, that you were talking about, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and it is, so we're talking, and I think, I think we're talking about two different things at the same time, right? Because we're talking about non-parametric methods as it's used in this book. And then there's also a different class of like non-parametric null hypothesis tests um, that yeah. are frequently used in the, in the social sciences at least for sure. Um, but that are pretty different from what we're describing here because they do, they do still have a model. Um, so yeah, I think those are different, but that was confusing for me as well, May, because like when I think of non-parametric tests, that's the first thing that I think of is that, um, you know, non-parametric versions of sort of standard null hypothesis significance tests. But here we're talking more about like splines and, and stuff. Uh, hello. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think for the model base, I think the difference between parametric and non-parametric is that the non-parametric is when you have 
classifications that you can't separate using a line or nice curves and you need to have many many curves and lines to do the job which can be quite complicated so i think the most obvious one would be the decision tree whereby you can't really separate things with a line anymore but for decision tree isn't it is separate like how they break down into sections so they usually calculate the purity and they break down into sections. So you can't even like do a curly curve. It has to be like straight line when you make the decision tree. So let's say you divide by like one third into two thirds, then like for the two thirds, uh, then you keep on splitting based on purity. That is the part where you can't really use a function anymore, like, oh. like polynomials or more complicated functions. So it means that once we can't specify a functions out like a polynomial or like you, you can't do like a linear or quadratic or cubic functions. So it's more, it will consider as a non-parametric model. It's something like that. Um, so that's, that's a really good point because you, you, can, you can generate a very wiggly parametric model. <laughs> If you want to, um, by using polynomials and interactions and um, you know squared terms and things like that. Um, but I think the difference is that in a wiggly parametric model, there is a, a model articulated before you fit. So you do have to say like I'm going to try um, you know a fifth order polynomial here, which would be very wiggly. Um, but you specify a fifth order polynomial, and then you know what parameters you're fitting. You estimate the parameters from the training data versus a, param a non-parametric model where you, you wouldn't have that, you wouldn't specify a model beforehand. Um, you would just specify a, a level of smoothness or roughness. Um, uh, that makes sense, yeah. So it's more like data-driven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a good, a good way to put it. Um, so we can certainly like come back to this too, if folks have more thoughts, but um, kind of thinking about uh, model accuracy versus interpretability, which I think is a really interesting question here. Um, so when we can, when we do have access to these more flexible models, why would you not always do that? Um, and part of the answer is that sometimes the flexible models become very difficult to actually understand. It's more of that black box situation. And if your goal is inference, then a very flexible model, you know, isn't actually going to help you much, even if you get a great model. Um, if you can't tell what's happening, uh, if you can't actually explore the relationships clearly between the predictors and the outcomes, then that model doesn't really suit your purposes. Um, so yeah, flexible approaches can lead to really complicated estimates of F uh, such that it's difficult to understand how any individual predictor is associated with the response. So that's sort of a downside of more flexible models. Um, and then switching gears a little bit, thinking about supervised versus unsupervised learning. Um, the big difference here is with supervised problems, you have a labeled data set with a response measurement. So you actually have a response variable to work with. And in unsupervised problems, um, you don't. So the challenge then is, you, so you basically just have a set of predictors with no response would be a way to think about it. And so these are questions where you're looking more to characterize patterns, to drive clusters, um, maybe to engage in like dimension reduction type stuff, uh, but not, not directly uh, relating it to an outcome variable. And then regression versus classification. Basically, regression models have a quantitative outcome, so like a continuous or numerical outcome. Uh, and classification problems have a categorical or a qualitative outcome. Um, and quantitative variables, yeah, quantitative variables take on numerical values, and qualitative variables take on values in classes or categories. And again, this is about the outcome variable. <clears throat> Generally, it doesn't make a difference uh, whether your predictors or your independent variables 
our quantitative or qualitative, most models will work fine with one or either or a combination of both. But when your outcome variable changes, then you often need a different kind of model. Okay, so that's the that's like the really vocabulary heavy section of the beginning. Um, the next next bit talking about model accuracy. Um, basically, like they say, there's no free lunch. Um, if there were like one best method, then there wouldn't be so many stats books. Um, but the truth is that the the best method is going to depend on your question and your goals, uh, also on the particular data that you have and patterns in the data, issues like missingness, all of that stuff. So it really requires a lot of knowledge to be able to select the right approach. And that's that's a big part of the, the work for a, a statistician or an analyst. Um, measuring quality of fit. Um, so they talk a lot about mean squared error, MSE, uh, as a way to measure how well a model's predictions actually match the observed data. Um, and here's the equation representing that here. Um, in terms of interpretation, basically the mean squared error will be small if the predicted responses are very close to the true responses. And it'll be large if for at least some of the observations, the predicted and the true responses differ substantially. Um, so small mean squared error means a better fitting model. Um, and one thing that's really important to keep in mind is measuring fit on your training versus your test, right? Um, because generally what we're doing is we're fitting a model to our training data um, and we're trying to minimize the error in our uh, estimation of the training data. But what we actually care about is error in the test data. So they give a couple of really good examples of that, um, you know, predicting like maybe your training data is uh, the last six months of the stock exchange, um, but you don't want to predict whether it's going to go up or down six months ago. Like you want to know if it's going to go up or down tomorrow or next month. Um, or if you're working with patients, maybe you have uh, a bunch of demographics and background on health variables, and then an indicator of whether or not that patient has diabetes. So you're trying to build a model to predict whether or not they have diabetes. And it's not that you actually want to know for these existing patients, it's that you want to be able to know for the next patient that comes in. So it's that test uh, prediction that really matters. Um, so yes, and here's an articulation of um, what that might look like on your test data. We want to select the best model for which this quantity is as small as possible on unseen future samples. Um, they also talked a little bit about the degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom is a quantity that summarizes the flexibility of a curve. So the training mean squared errors declines monotonically as flexibility increases. And that is the training mean squared error. So as you have a more flexible model, you're gonna get a better and better fit to the data you're looking at. The problem is that it doesn't mean you'll get a better fit on the data you're, the test data that you're not looking at. Um, and that's the basically the issue with overfitting. As model flexibility increases, the training mean squared error will decrease, but the test mean squared error might not. Um, and when a given method yields a small training mean squared error, but a large test mean squared error, then that is when we're overfitting the data. So it fits the training data really well, but it is not generalized. So would the degree of freedom kind of mm -hmm. interchangeable as MSC or um, I guess, you know, I see it as kind of like an error <laughs> degree of error or freedom, but are they interchangeable or I'm wondering whether I'm getting the definitions a little kind of. Yeah, really good question. Um, so they're, so they're, they are distinct. Um, degrees of freedom is a feature of your approach. So it, it doesn't depend on the data. So mean squared error is how your approach fits on those data, basically. So it is an error term. Degrees of freedom though is actually uh, just describes the model itself. Um, and so a model with more degrees of freedom is going to have more flexibility. And you, if you're thinking just in terms of linear models, um, then the degrees of freedom for a linear model is going to be based on how many predictors you put in. So if you have, um, if, if you have a model with no predictors at all and you're just predicting from the, the mean, then that has one degree of freedom only. But if you put in 12 predictors, then you're gonna have 13 degrees of freedom because you have a lot more flexibility there. 
you're using a lot more information and there's many more parameters to tweak. Um, and so you can potentially get a much better fit because you have a lot more degrees of freedom. Does that make sense? That's kind of a quick and dirty explanation. Yep, that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, like roughly you can think of degrees of freedom as being a measure of the model flexibility. So um, mean squared error, or yeah, mean squared error for a given value can always be decomposed into the sum of three fundamental quantities, the variance of f hat of x o, the squared bias of f hat of x o, and the variance of the error terms. Um, so here's that equation here. And is this, this is not the same one that we were looking at right before we got started. Um, but it's a little similar. Yeah, it looks very similar, but um, I think maybe there was a second line. I think it's different. Yeah. Um, but basically, <clears throat> the so the variance of uh, f hat is how much your um, how much your model changes on different data sets. So. Uh, a model with really low flexibility is going to be very similar, regardless of the training data that you give it, because it's not, um, it's, it, you know, it's not adhering super closely to the training data. So that would be a low variance model. Um, and then bias is how far f hat is from the true f, basically. So this is like how wrong your model is. <laughs> Um, and all models are going to be wrong to different degrees. Um, but if your model is relatively close to the underlying truth, then you would have a small bias term here. Um, whereas if your model is quite wrong, like if you're fitting a linear model through something where there's really a pronounced curve in the data generating function, then you would have a lot of bias introduced here. Ooh. We have Rahul's um, derivation for the equation we were talking about. Oh, awesome. Thank you. So we, we can talk about this later as well. I saw, sorry to move it into other direction. I just thought of yeah, there. no, this is but this is fantastic. Thank you. What the main thing was that uh, we assume that uh, expected value of uh, the irreducible error is zero, and that's the main. Some things will cancel out, and uh, the sigma square expected value of sigma square will become the variance. That challenge. Yeah, this is this is very helpful. Thank you. It, it it really does help me to see things derived because they, I know they're trying in this book to keep it a little bit light on the math, um, which is nice. But it also means that sometimes they say like it can be shown, um, and just kind of wave their hands and, and let it go. So it is helpful to to see you work through this. Thank you. Um, Thank you. This is this kind of fits, I guess, fills a gap between the first line and the second line. I think. Um, so yeah, uh, jumping back to this uh, variance bias and then that irreducible error, basically. Uh, and we have a couple visualizations here to sort of show what might be going on. So um, for this data set, this is, I believe, simulated data and the uh, black curve is the real data, data generating function here. So that's like the true F. And then they overlay a couple different curves of different potential models. So there's this straight gold line that represents a linear model. And then there's this light blue curve um, that is a, a model with a little bit more flexibility. And then there's um, this green squiggle, which has lots and lots of flexibility. And you can see is really chasing the data as it moves through the plot. Um, and so in terms of uh, variance and bias, the linear model would probably be low variance. Uh, we'd probably end up with a similar linear model if we took another uh, data set, another comparable data set, 
we might end up with a, you know, a similar linear model on that. So there would be very little variance in the model, but there's definitely some substantial bias here in this model. It's, it's pretty wrong, um, especially as you look at the sort of higher values of X. So it's dramatically underestimating these values around 60, and then it's overestimating these values over 80. So there's definite bias in the linear model. Um, the green model has, uh, uh, I guess it has both. So this would be this would be high variance. It has so much flexibility that it's really chasing the individual points in the data. And so if we had a different random sample of data here, we would end up with a very different green curve. Um, so that's a lot of variance in that model. It also has bias. Uh, that's because it's chasing the data too closely. Um, so it's actually moving away from the true estimate there. Um, and what we're looking at here is the this gray line is the mean squared error for the training set. And so you can see, as they said, this is just monotonically decreasing as we get more and more flexible models. So from the linear to the curve to the very squiggly curve, um, we're getting a better and better fit in the training data. But this is the test mean squared error. And so you can see this is pretty bad for the linear model. And then it gets much better as we introduce a small amount of flexibility. Um, and then it starts to increase again as we uh, introduce too much flexibility. So this is overfitting that's happening here. And this dashed line represents the um, irreducible error. So we're never going to get down to zero for our mean squared error because there's irreducible error as well. Any questions about this stuff? This was like pretty central, I think, to the chapter. I thought they provided like a really nice explanation of this. I liked it a lot. I think um, this variance bias trade-off is really important like for all the subsequent chapter that you'll be covering in like three, four, five, six. So you guys, if like, you are really not familiar with it, you should you might want to go through this specifically this mm. subsection because it will be important for all your subsequent chapter. Thank you. That's that's very good to know. That makes a lot of sense too. And when you say this section, are you talking about the assessed model accuracy, the second section, or this kind of subsection? This, uh, we, so this subsection on the variance <laughs> bias trick off. So like I think this will be under subsection. Was it 2.2.1? The measuring quality of it, is it? Yeah, I think that's right, right? 221. Yeah, like, yeah, no, it's supposed to be like 222. <laughs> so 222, the bias okay. variance like trade off. So you might want to just look at the U shape for the test MSE curve. So that's very important. So the, the, that is just talking about the variance bias trade-off. That's one way to look at it. Then the visualization for the, um, in figure 2.11, that's also another way of looking at it, the variance bias trade-off. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And the like one of the big take-home points with variance and bias here is that it's, it's actually really easy to minimize one of them right? Like if you want to have a low variance model, great, just use the mean <laughs> um, and, you know, run, run a straight horizontal line through the data. You're going to have very low variance, but of course it's going to be a really wrong model. So you're going to have very high bias if you do that. Um, and on the other end, if you really want to reduce bias, um, you can totally do that. You're going to overfit the data though. Um, and then you're going to have very high variance. And so there's, the real problem is trying to minimize both of these quantities at the same time when they they really tip each other. Uh, and so this is just another example, like another similar plot here, um, but we have really different underlying data. So here the underlying data has a pronounced curve to it. Um, and here it doesn't. Here the underlying data is actually pretty close to linear in truth. And so in this case, um, a linear model actually does not introduce a lot of bias. And so you can see the linear model here has um, 
it has low mean squared error for test and it also has very low mean squared error, sorry, low for the training and also very low for the test. And we can reduce our test mean squared error a tiny bit by introducing some more flexibility here in the blue curve. Um, but it's a, it's a small reduction. And then you can see it shoots up uh, pretty quickly as we start overfitting the data with more flexibility there. So this is a perfect example of the sort of no free lunch situation, right? So the, the best model to pick really depends on the data. Um, it's not something that you can know beforehand. In this case, we have another example of the same phenomenon. Uh, in this case, we have some very nonlinear data. We have this, um, this sort of sharp cubic-ish uh, curve here. Um, and so you can see we end up with a very different pattern in the mean squared error, where we're, we have very high error for the linear model because it's, it's, a, it's a bad model. So we have a lot of bias in the linear model here. Um, and then there's a dramatic drop in the mean squared error as we allow some more flexibility there. The blue curve does quite well. Um, and then in this case, because the data themselves, there's, there's less error, the data themselves are tighter together, um, there's less danger of overfitting. So the more flexible model does overfit. So it is showing an increase in the, um, mean squared error for a test, this red line, relative to a simpler model, but it's not nearly as dramatic as it is for a case where there's more spread in the data, um, like up here. And so like what's happening up here, you can, the green model is actually basically chasing the irreducible error up here. That's what's happening. Um, and there's more of it to chase. So it's, it's doing a worse job. And here there's a lot less error. And so the green model doesn't get as far from the true data generating um, process. And yeah, the trade-off is we need to select a statistical learning method that simultaneously achieves low variance and low bias. Um, more flexible methods, the variance will increase and the bias will decrease. Um, as we increase the flexibility of a class of methods, the bias tends to initially decrease faster than the variance increases. So that's that sweet spot that we're aiming for. Um, but at some point, increasing the flexibility has little impact on the bias and it starts to significantly increase the variance and that's overfitting. And you'll see your test mean squared error shoot up. Okay. Um, Should we just stop here? Because I was just thinking, like yeah, because this is kind of a natural pause here, um, switching to classification stuff. So yeah, yeah, let's let's pause here. Um, does anyone have any any questions or thoughts or? So if no other questions, like we should just end here because or else we'll just go into other. Yeah, you're right. We're almost at time. Book so. club time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So Perfect. if you have any other questions after we reading the chapters, you guys can just post the questions in the Slack and we will try to answer them. Great. <laughs> right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.